My name is Dr. Stephanie Lampkin, and I am the director of the Mitchell Center. And before we begin, I just want to read a brief land acknowledgement statement. Um, we begin by acknowledging with respect we gather today in Lenape Hoking, traditional homeland of Len Lenape people for tens of thousands of years. Sometimes translated as original people, the Lenape were known as mediators and called the grandfathers by the entire Algonquin family tree of languages. Within the first hundred years of foreign contact, 80% of the Lenape had already died from violent conflict and disease. But some Lenape never left. Hiding in plain sight as keepers of the land, the Lenape Indian tribe of Delaware based in Cheswold, Delaware, the Nanakoke Lenai Lenape tribal nation in Bridgeton, New Jersey, and the Ramapo Lenape nation in Mawa, New Jersey are three of the thriving Lenape communities today. Let us acknowledge the historical and ongoing presence of the Lenape and the Nanakoke on this land where we now live, work, and celebrate all our relations. So we are really excited to introduce Deanna Mitchell, who is our guest speaker today for our um, Harriet Tubman virtual program in celebration of Harriet Tubman Day uh, today on March 10th. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Deanna, Deanna Mitchell currently serves as superintendent of the Harriet Tubman National Historical Park in Church Creek, Maryland. With a total of 32 years federal government experience, she began her tenure with the National Park Service in 2005 as site manager for what is now the Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site. From 2016 to 2018, she served in the National Park Service, the Veneto Fellowship Program as a Legislative Affairs Specialist in the Office of Legislative and Congressional Affairs in Washington, D.C. In 2015, um, Deanna spent seven months on detail with the Department of the Interior's interagency team implementing the Every Kid in a Park initiative. Um, and so today, um, Ms. Deanna Mitchell will be sharing with us um, a presentation titled A Thread Runs Through Them, 19th and 20th Century African Americans Who Have Cultivated and Preserved Our Lands and Their Impact. So thank you and welcome, Deanna. Thank you, Stephanie. It is so good to be with you again. And um, <clears throat> it's funny because this is our, our second connection over the past couple years, and I'm always so thrilled um, to uh, receive requests for speaking engagements from you because um, we, we share uh, a similarity with regards to um, the Mitchell Center and your audience as well, um, the National Park Service, we're about education. And so this fits right in with our mandate. Uh, so thank you for allowing me to be a part of this special presentation. So as Stephanie mentioned, um, in thinking about um, how uh, best to present this information to you today, um, a thread runs through them. Um, I, I really wanted to make sure that this presentation was holistic in manner. In other words, um, we have been blessed with uh, individuals who, who lived on these lands, um, you know, 19th, 18th, 19th, 20th century, who have really, really provided uh, an example of conservation, environmentalism, preservation. And um, I think through this effort today, I hope that I, um, you know, pique an interest for you all to kind of uh, further learn about those types of individuals um, and how this is this all kind of represents our natural world. So um, let's let's go ahead and begin with the presentation. Uh, next slide, please, please. So today, basically, I'm going to be defining what our great outdoors is, or in other words, the, the way the National Park Service refers to it is our natural world, um, who uses our natural world 
And then I'm going to segue into a little bit of history about the National Park Service and the Underground Railroad. Um, next, then that's I will dive into the historical connections to the natural world by African Americans and then how and what they did during their time uh, here uh, on these lands impacted and influenced other generations to follow in their footsteps. Next slide. So I think it's important to take a look at our natural world then. Um, as you can see from some of the pictures, um, this is this is really what our lands looked like back in the 1800s when we were really struggling um, and trying to develop. People were moving out west to see what they could do to eke out a living. We had indigenous people who who were on these lands way before anyone settled here who were being moved uh, off of their lands. Um, and then, of course, we had African Americans who were brought over on uh, slave ships um, and put to work as slaves. Um, you know, they were, this was their way of living. So they were in the lands at the time. So how do we define our natural world? Well, back then it was by its origins um, and I've mentioned a couple of those um, just a few minutes ago um, by its purpose of course uh, labor habitation and then landscapes so um, and I think that last one landscapes is 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 pretty significant because um, most of the landscapes that we are that are around us um, have been untouched. They remain unimpaired as they were when, when this planet was created. Um, now, there are some connections that I think are significant with regards to the natural world back then. And um, for instance, genealogy, our descendants. I think we all, you know, have that curiosity to about, hey, where did I come from? You know what? You know um, what was my family like? Where where did where did they live? Those types of things, um, museums, and through education, our educators such as you. Um, so that's kind of a snapshot of what our natural world looked like back then. It was basically a way in which to eke out a living, specifically eke out a living, and it was also labor based. Next slide. So that brings us to our, our natural world now. How do we define it now? Well, uh, we can we can really um, walk out our doors and get in our car and take a drive. And the majesty of our landscapes is amazing. Um, they're, they're just they're beautiful. Uh, I, I saw, I witnessed the, the Grand Canyon for the first time um, two years ago, and I cried. As soon as I walked up to the rim, I could not believe the grandeur and the majesty of that particular historical park. I mean, it, it spans two states. It's just magnificent. And then, of course, the purpose. What is the purpose of our natural world? There is a historical significance to the purpose, and that's one of the reasons why the National Park Service was created. Um, and, of, and of course, um, hand in hand with that is the education, as I mentioned earlier, um, and, and then the enjoyment that, that we can get as we make our way into the natural world. Some of the connections to our natural world right now, um, they may be a little different from from our natural world then, uh, because we're talking about national parks and forests, wildlife and and scenic rivers, recreational areas, and other public lands and waters. Um, and as you can see um, from the photos that are on the right, that kind of gives you an idea of 
of what we of what we can enjoy and and what we can feel blessed to be around and to be able to access. Next slide, please. Oops. So um, in looking at this, as I mentioned, holistically, um, I think it's important for us to kind of ask who uses our great outdoors? Who uses our natural world? And this is going to help us as we move through this presentation to drill down into some of the African Americans um, who have who have um, uh, you know set in stone an opportunity for us to enjoy the the great outdoors. So, according to the Outdoor Foundation, um, and now these are statistics from 2019. So, the study indicated that roughly. 165 million Americans have participated in at least one activity, one, um, during 2019. Now, when you think about that, that's about half of our population because our population is uh, roughly 359 million people. So at least half of the folks that live in our nation um, have participated in one activity, at least one, uh, during that year. Now, when it comes down to the gender break on that, 46.2% 46 of those partic participants were female, uh, whereas 53.8 were male. And um, out of all the years in which this foundation has been conducting this study, because they conducted year after year after year. <laughs> I have I've seen statistics uh, that they well, well date back to 2016 when I struck an interest in finding out about this type of uh, about this type of thing. But this is the smallest gender gap on record. So what's what that's telling us is that women are um, out there, um, you know, out there just as much as as men are. Um, with um, enjoying our, our natural world. Um, the, the one statistic, however, or the two statistics, the two statistics, however, that are, are still a little bit concerning are Blacks and Hispanics uh, because they remain the lowest um, uh, underrepresented group within the study. And, and this has been something that has been um, that they've seen from year to year to year. Um, and I'll show you a breakdown in our next slide of what I'm talking about. Next slide. So I went ahead and compiled uh, stats from four different ethnic groups. And then I categorized them just to take a look at, at how the numbers ebb and flow. So <clears throat> as you can see, uh, whites um, are on the very top row. Their participation in the great outdoors is 50%. The question for column two, uh, do you have the skills and abilities to participate outdoors in activities? 16% uh, of, of whites said they do not. And then the last column, is it too expensive for you to participate? and activities outside um, in the great outdoors or in the natural world, and that's 18%. Um, the, next, the next row down are the Asian, Asian Americans. And as you can see, their participation is right there with, with whites. It's 1% above. And a little bit of similarity in the other two areas, 2% um, difference under uh, whether or not they have the skills or abilities to um, participate outdoors, and then 17% saying that it's too expensive. Then we get down to Hispanics and Blacks, and as you can see, um, the fourth row for Blacks, the participation is the low to, lowest out of the four groups, 33%, and then the highest when it when they're were asked the question of do you have the skills or abilities to participate, 21% um, 
which is a little, you know, of course, a little high. And, is, you know, uh, is it too expensive? And again, um, another, you know, high statistic. Um, Hispanics, um, you, you can see those numbers that roll across there. Again, um, the, the Blacks um, seem to have a, a little harder time in, in being able to participate in outdoor activities. You know, you know, maybe it's, you know, maybe they're not able to rent um uh you know a trailer or a camper to go camping or to pay fees for a campground or to rent a boat for kayaking or or what have you so i just think that's very interesting um you know interesting fact um but i think there's some help along the way um in those areas and i'll talk about that a little bit later next slide so I, I said all that to, to kind of move us into the National Park Service because within the National Park Service, our, you know, we have a mission and that mission is very clear and it's very concise. And that's to preserve and protect the natural, like I mentioned earlier, our natural world, our lands, um, our rivers, our streams, and our cultural resources as well. Um, the cultural resources, that's an aspect of the National Park Service that really came into existence, um, you know, many decades after we were established as a service. Uh, we were established in 1916, so we've been around for a while. Um, but I think it's wonderful that we have absorbed not just the natural resources, but the cultural resources. For instance, the museum here in Church Creek, Maryland, the Harriet Tubman National Historical Park is a cultural park because it speaks of the history of Harriet Tubman. The Grand Canyon is a natural park because of the natural setting. Yosemite is a natural park, you know. So um, we, are very proud of our history and our legacy. We currently have uh, 427 units within the park system. They're not all parks, uh, and you you can kind of get an idea if you look at bullet four. Uh, we have, oh my goodness, we have trails, <laughs> we have recreation areas, um, rivers, monuments. The Statue of Liberty is a national monument. Um, it's not a park, right? But it is something that the National Park Service through legislation, uh, excuse me, Congress through legislation and working with the National Park Service said this history is significant for us to preserve this and take care of it so that it could be around, <laughs> you know, through perpetuity. Um, there are over 20,000 employees within the National Park Service. So we are uh, a very, very large organization. We kind of have to be to manage those number of units. And what we're, we're also proud about is our volunteer, our volunteer program. Uh, we have over 221,000 volunteers that contribute 6.4 million hours annually. I got to repeat that. 221,000 volunteers <clears throat> who contribute 6.4 million hours annually to the National Park Service. We could not do this all by ourselves. And the people who volunteer are, the, are people who love the great outdoors, the natural world. And down in the left corner, I have a couple of little images that I want to talk about very briefly that, that really kind of shows how the National Park Service is really trying to reach out to people, to underrepresented communities that we talked about in that previous slide. Um, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm, uh, I have a couple of, we call them acronyms, but I put them on here because I kind of want to speak to them just briefly. So G-A-O-A -O -G stands for 
the Great American Outdoors Act. And that is a bill that was passed in August of last year, 2020. And we are so excited about that bill because it has earmarked, let's see, I think it's $900 million every year for five years for the, for the uh, National Park Service and other agencies that fall under the Department of Interior to help, um, uh, let's see, in other words, like to work on our infrastructure, um, to take care of maintenance on some of our facilities and our units that are that need help. You know, some of some of our facilities have been around for years, and there's not been money to put into helping to restore them, but this act allows us to do that. And we don't wanna have crumbling structures for, for the public to come and visit. So Go, Goa, that's how you pronounce it, G-O-A-A, G-A-O-A, Goa is something that's really gonna be beneficial for the next five years for us to really, really take a look at our infrastructure. And then the other little piece to this, every kid in a park, that is something, every kid, every kid in a park, E-K-I-P, that is a program that President Obama um, wanted to pursue uh, back in 2015. And he, he, he gave it to the Department of Interior and, and said, here's the concept and idea that I have, and can you please develop a program, uh, you know, to, to meet these goals that I have. And I was a part of the team. I, I was on, uh, took a detail to be a part of the team. And every kid in a park is a way that um, the National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, there are a number of other bureaus within in Interior. We all came together and we developed a program where fourth graders, fourth graders would be able to visit any park that that they and their family wanted to and it would cost them nothing there would be no entrance fee um and the the good thing about every kid in the park is there were we had partners in the transportation arena who were wonderful and they stepped forward and said look we will help this program with this program by providing transportation for families who aren't able they don't have transportation to these parks so we had greyhound i mean we had everyone involved in this program and um and it was great because the uh the fourth graders they learned about it in school their teachers of course knew about it we worked through scholastics to build this program it was an online program in which the the teachers um could could take to the students the students they would go through a number of activities to get their card they would download their card they presented this card and it was for a whole year they could go to any park that they wanted with their families um and i tell you we really did reach out into those communities um, that were just thirsty to learn more about our natural world, our great outdoors. So, and there are other initiatives um, that we are working on. Um, the Every Kid in a Park was so successful. Um, and it's, it's amazing because we absorbed the funding to do this in-house, right, within Interior, but it was so successful that Congress took up the mantle and said, you know what? Why don't we secure funding for this to happen year after year after year? It They changed the title, of course, it's Every Kid Outdoors. And now there's money to help with Every Kid Outdoors. So um, that's just an example how we're really trying to help boost some of those statistics that we saw earlier. Next slide, please. So um, Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Historical Park. That is a picture to the right of our visitor center. 
and it was established back in 2013 as the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Monument by President Obama. And after he proclaimed that, Congress went to work to establish the legislation, you, you know, you always want to have legislation because a les what, a leg what legislation does, it provides funding, federal funding. So they went to work immediately after that and they established legislation for the, uh, under public law 113-291 for the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Historical Park. And that established our park in Church Creek, and then it also established the Harriet Tubman National Historic Park in New in Auburn, New York. So um, we have a sister park, and we're proud of that sister park because this is where Harriet Tubman was born in Church Creek, Maryland, and she of course escaped in 1849, secured her freedom in Philadelphia, and she eventually landed. Um, at her home in Auburn, New York, where she is also buried. Um, so, and once that legislation was developed by Congress, the monument and the historical park became one unit. So we are just referred to as the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Historical Park. That is our address. Please write it down because we would love to see if not, if you have not been here yet. Next slide, please. So these are just a couple of um, images from inside our visitor center. It opened in 2017, so it's still fairly new. You can still smell the fresh paint. Um, and we have a cooperating association, Eastern National, um, and that's an agreement with the National Park Service. So our Eastern National is our gift shop. So, you know, people when, when they're out and they go to a museum, you know, they may want to make their way into a gift shop to to pur purchase some things that they would like keepsakes that they would like to take home with with them. So we opened in March. So from March 2017 to December, our visitation was 120,000 people. That's a lot of folks uh, in 10 months. And our, our, we netted our sales were $243,875. Um, now we are not a big museum, but because of the interest of Harriet Tubman, people came. March the 10th is significant. Um, today is March the 10th, 2021. This is, um, you know, when Stephanie asked me to be a part of this, I totally understood what she was getting at because you know, March 10th is declared Harriet Tubman Day, as you all know, um, you know, um, in the in in the United States. Um, I think George Herbert Walker Bush in 1990 uh, declared that. Um, it's also Women's Woman Women's History Month. So, you know, we there are two for one here. Um, and then, of course, March 10th, 1913 is also when Harriet Tubman passed away. So there's a lot of symbolism around that date of March the 10th. The significance of our museum here is it does serve serve as a regional example of the larger and diverse international network to freedom that involve freedom seekers and their and their allies. So <clears throat> this is where it all started from for her. This is when she was deciding in her mind, you know, how do I how do I gain my freedom? So we're very proud of our center here. And again, uh, if you've not been here, uh, we'd love to have you. If you've been here before, we'd love to have you come back. Next slide, please. So we went from the natural world then and now, and uh, which is important because that kind of brought us into what the National Park Service, what our mission is. And we, you know, we are here to help preserve these wonderful um, landscapes and facilities. And we talked about the um, visitor center here. Um, and now I just wanted to take a moment 
to kind of give you an idea about the Underground Railroad, and this is um, in this is from like the 19th century. This is a map um, that demonstrates this was just not a, a stretch of um, a trail that went from Cambridge, Maryland, or Church Creek, Maryland, into Delaware, into Pennsylvania. Um, there were a number of routes. Uh, as you can see, the white the white um, arrows show you the different areas and the different transitions that were made along the Underground Railroad. Um, the states that you see highlighted in a, it's kind of like a, a light mauve color, um, those were the slave states. The free states are up towards the north and they're they're more kind of a light greenish color, if you will. And then there are certain cities that are pinpointed on here. Um, and this is an international, this, this is why I mentioned in a previous slide, International Network to Freedom, because you had segues into British Canada. Of course, we, we know that Harriet Tubman uh, made her way into Ontario, Canada. Um, and then, of course, Mexico, uh, transitions into Cuba and into Mex and into um, the Bahamas. So it was a very intricate, intricate network of uh, pathways uh, that freedom seekers took to make their way to freedom. Next slide. So the state of Delaware, um, we I definitely want to give a nod to the state of Delaware because I think really one of the most beautiful monuments that I have ever seen is the unveiling. I, I call it the unveiling um, to see Harriet Tubman, you know, there and uh, Thomas Garrett and to see the, the child that she has um, and the refugees that are are there with her. The child that is literally um, was given a little bit of something to <laughs> to um, you know allow them to uh, not cry and be quiet um, as as uh, she was transitioning fam families north. Um, it, it, it's a to me it's a moving monument because it's a moving story, which all ties to that word pursuit. Pursuit of freedom, pursuit of happiness. I, I mean, so my my hat goes off to um, to you guys there in Delaware and Wilmington. That is just an exquisite um, monument that um, has been commissioned. Um, and Wilmington, of course, you know, when you think about it, it it really was the last city on the station. In the state of Delaware, it was the last city or station for an underground railroad because if you look to your north you have pennsylvania right freedom and then new jersey you know to your right so um what a pivotal place and um you know uh that that really um put delaware on the on the map you know during during the time of of the underground railroad now again uh, I think there are like seven, I think so far there have been seven historic sites that uh, that that individuals can see uh, along the uh, byway uh, there in Delaware. Um, but but that's a that's a pivotal place, Wilmington, Delaware. Um, and I, I really just wanted to take a moment to um, to recognize that and to say that we totally understand um, we understand how important that piece of history is um, and, and we're right there with you. Next slide. Again, I, I just I, I did touch upon the Harriet Tubman byway. Um, there is a driving tour guide uh, for the Harriet Tubman byway. Um, it is managed by the Maryland Tourism Department uh, 125 mile byway uh, on the shore that makes its way into Delaware and into Pennsylvania. 
uh, there are 45 historic sites designated on the byway. And uh, but for me, um, and in speaking with some of our partners here in the state of Maryland, um, I think we can I think we can further progress on that byway. In other words, um, there may be other opportunities uh, for other historic sites to be depicted along that byway, and um, it would be a nice goal to see if we could really um, make this byway reach all the way up into Canada, you know, through New York and up in, in, into Ontario. Um, I know that Diane Miller, who is our um, national program manager for the Network to Freedom program, I know that she's been working very, very hard um, with um, our international friends in Canada regarding the, the Underground Railroad. But I think this is a project that should bring all of us together, not just the state of Maryland, right, but Delaware, uh, New York, and and of course Canada, um, and, and see what we can do. That's 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 one of those goals that I think is achievable, but uh, but it's going to take a, a lot of work and a lot of coordination. Uh, but we do have people who have made their way along the byway, and I'll talk about one of those groups uh, later in the presentation. Um, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful um, experience and a wonderful opportunity for visitors to take part in. Next slide, please. So now I, I want to take a, a moment in this section of the presentation and talk about those individuals, African Americans I mentioned earlier, who have who have paved the way and played a role in our natural world, um, and and how they did that. So I would be remiss if I did not start off with Harriet Tubman. Um, you know, born here, Dorchester County, 1822. Uh, she passed away, of course, in 1913, as I mentioned earlier. And we refer to her as the 19th century ultimate outdoors woman. Um, you know, um, when she was born um, as a little girl, um, she was loaned out as a slave to families in this area by her slave owners. Um, as a little girl, you know, if she was, uh, tending to a new a, a newborn baby right she's she's five or six and she's um trying to help quiet a little baby if that little baby wasn't quiet um she felt the wrath of the whip because of that you know um it was just unbelievable conditions for her as as a little girl uh as a 13 year old she was struck in the head with a weight you know that that gave her, that literally almost killed her. And she suffered from that injury for, for her entire life. She had seizures because of that. So Harriet was not really the type of person who preferred domestic work because of the, the treatment that she got. So she, she would much rather be outdoors. And that's what she did. She learned her trade of timber harvesting from her father. She worked out with the men. She was strong as an ox. And um, when she when she emancipated herself in 1849, um, she really rose to the level of the most famous conductor on the Underground Railroad. People refer to her as Moses. Um, she was a very um, spiritual woman and she felt that if she just listened to God, the messages that he was sending her, that she would be successful in her pursuits. Um, because of her abilities to navigate by the stars, by the North Star, by the Big Dipper, um, the Union Army they called on her to to be to help them, to, you know, w uh, during the Civil War, and she stood up to the challenge and she 
not only was a spy for the Union Army, but she was a nurse. She was a cook. She did anything that she could do to help um, end slavery. Now, her connections to the real world, or excuse me, to the natural world, well, I think you know, you can look at some of the bullets that um, I have there on the slide. Of course, survival was key. You know, she knew the tributaries around here. She knew the paths. You know, she knew how to, you know, she used to trap muskrats, right? So she knew what she could eat in order to survive um, and to help others to survive. Um, that she just had this ability to understand uh, navigation. And that really, um, that really is one of the things that she's really known for. Uh, you know, she didn't have a compass. She didn't have a phone. It was all up here. It was all up in her brain. It was what her father taught her. Um, and that's why we consider her the, the ultimate outdoors woman. Her legacy, we are carrying it on here in Church Creek, Maryland. And as I mentioned earlier, our sister park in Auburn, New York. There are many other um, uh, entities and organizations throughout the nation that do honor Harriet Tubman. Yes, I, you know, we're not the only ones, right? But we are the ones that um, hopefully um, people will recognize that this was a national designation of, of her legacy. So, next slide, please. The second individual that um, I wanted to just briefly talk about today is Colonel Charles Young, uh, born 1864. He passed away in 1922. And uh, I kind of looked at him as a 20th century, 20th century conservationist. Um, born into slavery and uh, but was a very, very intelligent um, young man. Uh, you know, he graduated at the top of his class in, uh, in uh, high school in Ohio and um, attended West Point. Now, during that time, it was very, very, it was very, very difficult um, for any African American uh, to make their way in to West Point, but uh, but he did. Um, and so, you know, 1884, he graduated in, eight, in 1889, and only two other African Americans had been to West Point uh, prior to him. Um, one of the things that I'm really proud about uh, with uh, uh, Colonel Young is that he was the very first African American superintendent of the National Park Service. Now, we were founded in 1916, but prior to um, our designation in 1916, we fell under the Department of State. So um, we still were um, designated to preserve and protect uh, our natural uh, resources at that time, but we officially became the National Park Service in 1916. That's why you see the difference, why you see in 1903 he was appointed as, uh, that's because we were still serving uh, in a role of preserving our natural resources, but under the Department of State. Um, Sequoia National Park, the first superintendent, that's unbelievable. Um, but his role at that time was um, helping to develop the park, helping to build trails for their wagons. Right? All right. We're talking about, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, the, the early, early 1900s. Um, this this was important for visitors to be able to get in and to uh, enjoy Sequoia National Parks. Um, he led the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, I don't know how many of you know about the Buffalo Soldiers, but literally the Buffalo Soldiers were actually the first park rangers in a national park. By horseback, it was their role to uh, be on the park grounds of Yellowstone and 
not only Yellowstone, but there were other places in which um, they served as park rangers. So um, that's an important piece of our history that a lot of people may not know about. But Colonel Young was very pivotal and important in helping to lead those park rangers and to do the work to help establish access for people to enjoy Sequoia. He is also commemorated through the National Park Service and um, and that's through the Charles Young Buffalo Soldiers National uh, Monument, which is in Wilberforce, Ohio. That's that was his home. And then we have George Washington Carver. 1864, he passed away in 1943. We look at him as a 19th and 20th century botanist. He was an inventor and he was an agricultural scientist. So uh, uh, born in Diamond, Missouri, um, 1894, um, that's where he received his, de his degree in botany at Iowa State Ag Agricultural College. And he really enjoyed what he did there in Iowa. He um, developed some amazing um, uh, opportunities uh, for agriculture and for medicine. Um, but but back in Tuskegee, Alabama, um, uh, Booker T. Washington, who was the founder of Tuskegee Institute, actually it was first called Tuskegee Normal School. Uh, he founded that in 1881 and he had heard about uh, Dr. Carver and he wanted Dr. Carver to leave Iowa <laughs> from the university there and come and head up his agricultural department that he wanted to build up um, and at, at Tuskegee Normal School. And uh, Dr. Carver at first didn't really want to hear of that because he was very satisfied where he was. But, but Booker T. Washington knew that he needed someone like Carver because the people that lived in that particular area of Alabama in the South, uh, particularly the folks who um, who didn't have a lot of money, um, who were share, you know, who were uh, slaves. Um, he knew that they needed an opportunity to learn how to work the land in order to, to be able to have food. And, you know, as Washington continued to to um, talk to him and to persuade him. Eventually, <laughs> uh, George Washington Carver said, okay, I will come. And they had a wonderful partnership. The department uh, flourished. He got out in the community. Um, he he talked about, um, he, he, he showed the people of the community how to, to turn their crops, how to live off the land. Um, sweet potatoes, soybean. He was known, they, many people called him the, fe the peanut man, um, but he was a conservationist, an environmentalist, and he was there to help poor families. Um, to this very day, uh, I think it was um, established in 1973, the George Washington Carver Museum. It is there at Tuskegee Institute. Um, so in those three pictures that I have there, the third one at the bottom, as you can see, he is shaking hands with President Roosevelt. President Roosevelt was so uh, um, excited about what he was doing there at Tuskegee Institute that he made his way to Tuskegee several times, a number of times, to partner with Dr. Uh, Dr. Carver and um, it, you know, it was just kind of like a match made in heaven. Uh, they really supported each other. Next slide. So those are three individuals I just wanted to kind of talk to you a little bit about today. And this ties back to a thread runs through them. And as you can see, I've weaved a thread from Harriet Tubman into Colonel Young into, into George Washington Carver. 
you can see that they have a, a number of similarities in their contribution to the natural world, to the great outdoors. Harriet Tubman, survival, cultivate the land, and what she did was a benefit to others. Carl Jung, cultiv cultivate, right? Preserve, he's a superintendent, and also a benefit to others. Uh, George Washington Carver, survival, cultivate, preserve, and a benefit to others. So, you know, I always want people to kind of ponder and to think how how did their connections translate to African Americans and the outdoors in the 21st century and for generations beyond. In other words, um, what do we see from their works? You know, how do we see that kind of transferring into, uh, you know, current day? Next slide, please. So um, there are a number of organizations, uh, African American um, organizations, uh, not just African American, but um, there are other members um, as well, Asian Americans, uh, white Americans, um, but they have formed and they've organized to get out there and to get involved. Get out there and get involved. Um, just to go over a couple of them, uh, minorities in agricultural, um, natural resources and related sciences. This is a phenomenal organization and it's a nonprofit and it promotes the academic and professional um, advancement by empowering minorities and associated fields to, to produce a diverse pool of talented leaders. Um, and T to be very, very honest with you, this is a product of George Washington Carver. It really is. Um, and I have um, had the uh, luxury or uh, the pleasure of meeting a number of very bright young leaders within that organization um, that are setting that setting an example for the next generation. Um, then there's outdoor outdoor Afro. This is another nonprofit, and it's particularly, you know, African Americans, um, and they're, they're looking at a way to have them reconnect to the natural world through outdoor recreation. Um, so, you know, um, there is there is a statistic, and this goes back to the Outdoors Foundation, that people who um, experience the great outdoors um, as a child or in their teens, as they become adults, because they've gone through that experience and because it's just become a part of their life, their children tend to follow suit. In other, in other words, they tend to grow up in, in, in the same with the same exposure. Um, and this is one of those organizations, I think, that is um, that's paramount, paramount for um, you know getting people to really kind of get outdoors and and enjoy that part. And what's amazing is they reach 40,000 40, people per day um, through their website, through their um, social media. So that's an amazing organization. Next slide. Girl Trek, and many of you may have heard about Girl Trek. Um, again, another nonprofit. Their focus is is public health. What better way <laughs> to focus on your health than being outdoors? Um, and I have seen this group in action. Um, they are grounded, totally grounded, in the history of civil rights and the principles of walking, uh, community leadership, and health advocacy. Um, actually, they they were their goal. Um, you know, they have a goal, and I'm I'm not sure what leg they are on right now, but they have a goal to walk all 125 miles 
of the Tobin Byway. And what they do is they break it up into a number of years. So one, I, I'm not sure exactly when they started, but like the first year they did 20 miles and then they come back the next year and they do 20, 20 miles, 20 more miles until they get to 125. And they are, they were inspired because of Harriet Tubman. They do this in honor of Harriet Tubman. They wear Harriet Tubman, um, you know, uh, shirts, t-shirts and, and you, you name it. Um, and they do make they, their way here every year, um, in their pursuit of their 20 miles. So a wonderful organization. And then lastly, I put this on here. This is every kid in the park. I talked about it early, um, earlier, and I think that it's just, it's just a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful initiative that really grew into um, this program that's reaching so many kids. There are so many kids that have come up to me and say, I have never seen water before. You know, I live in the city. I've never knew what it was like to put my feet in the sand, you know, down in Gulf Shores, Gulf, Gulf Shores Island in Florida. They never knew what it was like to, to take off their shoes and put their feet in the sand. They've never been snorkeling before. You know, they had an opportunity to, to go snorkeling. So um, every kid in the park, n now it's really kind of named every kid outdoors. Um, you can go online and find out about all of these wonderful uh, organizations. But I do believe that we are seeing through these organizations what Harriet Tubman, what George Washington Carver, and what Colonel Charles Young, you know, the impact of what they did in in being outdoors, getting outdoors, working outdoors, cultivating outdoors, and establishing something that generations can latch on to and that we can all be proud of. Next slide, please. So um, I would be remiss if it, if I did not speak about um, our Native Americans, people who were on these lands many, many years ago people who taught the settlers, you know, how to grow tobacco, you know, how, 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 how to live, how to fish. Um, the Native Americans understand the natural world, I think, better than anyone. Um, they view it as a sacred living being. So with that and on that note, I do want to leave you with this quote. There is a way that nature speaks, that land speaks. Most of the time, we are simply not patient enough, quiet enough to pay attention to the story. Linda Hogan, Native American writer in residence to Chickasaw Nation. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, and students, um, that is the end of my presentation. Um, I hope that you have enjoyed it. Um, I know there's not an opportunity for questions and answering sessions. However, um, please feel free. Um, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, you know, perhaps Stephanie and I can work out a, a way in which um, I can, you can get those to me and I can get back with you um, because um, that's what it's all about, communication, dialogue, and understanding. So I thank you again, and God bless you all. Thank you so much, Deanna. And for those of you who have questions, um, you will receive an evaluation for this program, and we invite you back to the next. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.